Welcome back to Saturday morning here on Money FM 89.3. Glenn and Neil with you. Over now to our international news review with Steve Oaken. Good morning, Steve. Uh, it's Oaken, Steve Oaken. And good morning. <laughs> What, what did I say? He's auditioning for oh. Bond. <laughs> Get with the program. Oh, I see, knew the, you were Steve. And I had to say it was very good. <laughs> Thank Steve, you. Thank it's you. just not the same. It's just <laughs> not the same as Bond, James Bond. But nice try. Nice try. How are you doing today? I'm doing well and enjoying all of this discussion of who the next James Bond should be. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, I still, I'm throwing my hat in the ring with the Americans because the Americans, when they go to England, they, they know how to get things done. I was going to say, Neil, I don't know if you recognize my, my AFC Richmond jersey, but just another example of how the Americans can, sit, can succeed in, in England. <laughs> That's a very impressive jersey. That's from uh, the, uh, the show, the Apple show that I've been watching, Ted, uh, Ted um, Lasso. Lasso. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Great Steve, you never, cease, you never cease to <laughs> amaze us. All right, and you know what else never ceases to amaze us is the idiocy that happens in the U.S. Congress, uh, which is where we're going to start today uh, with our international news review. Um, first of all, the infrastructure vote that was supposed to take place apparently has now been delayed by Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. Is that correct? Correct. Look, all, all, that's, uh, all this hinges on is, is the future of the Biden presidency, the potential collapse of democracy in the United States and and the world being able to address uh, the climate emergency. So other than that, not much happening uh, in, in Washington. Uh, so what, what you've got going on now are there's there's two uh, bills that are moving uh, at the same time. And in this all relates to the fact that Republicans and Democrats basically refuse to get uh, to work together on almost anything other than um, on infrastructure in this one instance. And the Democratic party is very diverse. And so you have centrists on one side and progressives on the other who don't agree on a lot. And so we are coming you know, to a, a, a fiscal cliff uh, and, and a legislative cliff. And that's because you've got a $1.2 trillion infrastructure, which the centrists and some Republicans are supporting. And then you've got a $3.5 trillion bill that the centrists and, and, and moderates refuse to agree on. And unless you tie them together, they could both fail. And it's very difficult to tie them together. And that's where we stand today. Well, this is the bit of the thing, Steve, where sometimes Democrats get a bit of a rough reputation because here we are. This is the first time I believe since 2010, correct me if I'm wrong, that you've got the trifecta. You've got the president, you've got the both houses, uh, Democrat at the moment. You've got slim majorities, Democrats, but they have majorities nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Here's their opportunity to bring in this big democratic bill that you're talking about that is supposed to be a cornerstone of President Biden's uh, presidency and the Democrats themselves can't reach an agreement. Mm -hmm. It's either not far enough or it's too, too revolutionary, too liberal, whatever. What is really going on here between the Democrats? Is it a generational thing? Is it a political thing? What is the divide here? I mean, I think it's a political and it's, it's philosophical where you have you know, more, you know, centrist Democrats from states like, you know, West Virginia, which is a pretty conservative state, but you have a Democratic senator from there. You have a Democratic senator from Arizona who's who's very moderate as opposed to the other sides of the party, like California, um, New York, the, the you know, uh, the, the Northwest, where they're very liberal and progressive. So you have this stymieing happening where, there's agreement on a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, but everything outside of that, which addresses to should the United States have universal pre-kindergarten? Should there be home health care for the sick and the elderly? Should there be lower prescription drug prices? Should there be easier access to college education? All Democrats agree on those things in principle, but the competing factor is how much is it going to cost and what's it going to do to the national debt? And there are some Democrats who are saying, we like those things, but we're not going to spend any more than $1.5 trillion on it. And there's other Democrats <laughs> who say, no, we have to spend $3.5 trillion on it. So the question is, can we find a, a, a middle ground in the Democratic Party to pass this? And President Biden himself went up to the Congress yesterday to meet with the Democratic House caucus and to say, Let's aim for $2 trillion. We need to come together, Neil, to your argument. We need to come together as a party. We need to show that we can govern. Because if we can't, and I was only being a little joking at the start, 
we are going to lose in the midterms. And it's yeah. a lot of potential that Trump is going to come back and it's going to take mm. this country in a whole different direction. And that that is what I think is so interesting about the current fight that's happening among the Democrats. So you've got uh, AOC on the far left. Mm. You've got Joe Manchin, who's the 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 uh, representative from uh, West Virginia, who has very much been holding a lot of this stuff hostage uh, in recent months. And and they are they just kind of in your opinion and your estimation is are they just holding out till kind of the last minute and at the end of the day they're going to get on board and vote this thing because at least something is better than nothing and with the midterm elections coming up a year from now they've got to be seen as as doing something rather than a do nothing congress i I think that's the message joe biden delivered uh to, to democratic caucus i think glenn you were just you were just channeling him that we have to get something done um and The problem you have, the structural problem you have in the United States is that the Senate is a 50-50 tie. Vice President Mm -hmm. Harris breaks that tie. So every single Democratic senator can blow up this entire agreement. Um, And there's Mm -hmm. nothing anybody can do about it. And that that problem is there are plenty of Republicans who agree with a large part of what the Democrats are trying to do on health care, on education, on, on the climate crisis. Yet not a single Republican will vote with the Democrats. So that gives even more power uh, to the Democrats because the Republicans are so obstinate on this for for purely political reasons, not for for substantive reasons. And then in the House side, you only have a five vote majority and you've got 50 progressives like AOC who are saying we have one chance to fix income inequality. We have one chance to fix the environment. We have one chance to take care of those who need the most care when it comes to health care. We can't just compromise on this. We are going to take a hard line on it. I think at the end of the day, I'm an optimist. Compromise is going to get reached. Steve, just jumping in here. Is it too big a leap to say that potentially President Biden's legacy is at stake here? Because that was his whole mandate, wasn't it? He got elected as the bipartisan president. He's going to bring the two sides of the Congress together. He's going to bring two sides of the political divide together. At the moment, he can't even bring two sides of his own party together. No, that I mean, Neil, it, it's not whether he gets Republicans to vote for this. It's whether he we can that, get yeah. it to pass it all. Right. So it's not being bipartisan that he ran on. He ran on being competent, that coming mm. off of the Trump administration, we are going to be able to address the problems that this country has. And if it turns out that the Democrats, when they have control of the House and White House, can get nothing done and address the real problems that we face. This is going to hurt Biden, not only domestically, it's going to hurt the United States internationally, because what the United States is saying right, is democracies and, and, and our forms of government are better than the autocrats that you see in Russia and you see in China. But if the democracies can get nothing done, then this is going to hurt not only back home, it's going to hurt in the world. Um, the ability to, to for, for the United States and all it's trying to do with its partners, such as Japan and Australia uh, in India, in, you know, in, in, the, in the quad to lead. That's a great point. actually, Steve, do you, do you see any with this and the debt ceiling uh, issue that just was uh, came to a head this week as well? Is there a direct impact on Singapore, the trade relationship, the U.S. businesses that are here or the Singaporean businesses in the U.S.? Do we see any direct uh, impact on based on these two issues right now? Oh, I mean, uh, yes, uh, not not Singapore, but but the world. If the United States defaults on its debts, um, the United States, you know, when it issues bonds, when it when it when it borrows money, it does so based on the full faith and credit of the United States government. And there is a a debt ceiling that that the Congress has said that the country cannot go beyond. And of course, the country Mm -hmm. goes beyond it all the time. Because Democrats and Republicans always blow through the debt regularly, ever and yeah. <laughs> always. And, and yeah. so, what always happens is bipartisan. The debt ceiling gets raised. And what's happening now is that Mitch McConnell is being an absolute and utter hypocrite in saying, "Democrats, you control everything. You're not going to get a single Republican vote to raise the debt limit." And now, this is a bad vote to take because then the Republicans are going to bash the Democrats over their head for blowing through the debt ceiling. But of course, it's not the Democrats alone who blew through the debt ceiling. 
Donald Trump and the Republican Congress mm. blew through the debt ceiling because of all the tax cuts that they put forward that never got paid. Democrats and Republicans added to the debt to address the problems that we had with COVID. And now Mitch McConnell is being an absolute hypocrite because there's a Democrat in the White House as opposed to a Republican. So that Democrats not only have to pass infrastructure and not only they have to pass the 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 you know, the, the, the $3.5 trillion reconciliation package that's going to do all of this good socially, they've got to raise the debt limit on their own. And it's a very difficult thing to do legislatively. And if the United mm. States defaults on its debts, which it has never done in the history of the country, that is going to impact everyone everywhere. And, and the markets are starting to get nervous about this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, moving on, Steve. What you said earlier about different forms of government plays in nicely to our next point about COVID vaccinations, because this is there's a real fundamental political philosophical issue going on now where you're, the British, uh, sorry, the American economy, the American political system was very quick to vaccinate half of its population, shall we say, and Asia was lagging behind initially. But now Asia's caught up and in many countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, has actually overtaken the US in terms of inoculations, vaccinations and so on, which comes back to your earlier point about political systems not always being the most effective, shall we say, because what you're seeing now is COVID is US is lagging behind Asian countries in terms of inoculations where previously it was way ahead. Well, I think there's it, it's political, but it's, it's also cultural and it's also uh, historical in a way. I think part of it was was SARS. And, you know, we all live through SARS uh, here and we said, oh, you know, this is COVID's going to be like SARS. It's going to take about six months and it's going to go away. And if we lock down and we socially distance and we stop traveling um, and we stop shaking hands, we'll be fine. Um, obviously, the United States didn't deal with with SARS. And so they rec- they had a different approach off the bat that this is going to be a serious pandemic um, and they're going to put in billions of dollars to try and develop these vaccines. That was the only way we're going to get past it. So I think there's a little bit of a, I don't know if I want to use the word arrogance, but it, it was based mm-hmm. on the historical experience that, that in part Asia was out of the gate. In part, it was, we can lock down our borders like Singapore could lock down more than the United States could. Australia could lock down more than, than, than the United States could. And that turned out not to work. So things were getting changed uh, as well. And then the other thing is that there is no social safety net in a lot of countries in Asia like there is in the United States. Certainly there is in Singapore, where you could have massive government subsidies going to people who were out of work. You, you had the government pass laws that said, you know, you couldn't get evicted if you couldn't pay rent because of COVID. Well, here, so many people work, you know, there's no social safety net and they can't work from home. They have to go to work every day. So, you know yeah. what? They don't have a choice. They have to get vaccinated. And you're starting to see this in the United States now where, where, where you know, where, where companies are saying you're not vaccinated, you're going to get fired. And you're starting mm-hmm. to see the vaccination rate go up in the U.S. So it's an amalgamation of reasons. And, you know, hey, when, when the news came out that we can all now go to Australia if we're vaccinated, <laughs> like <there's> such <laughs> such happiness uh, in, mm-hmm. with certain people to be able to get off this island and go to other places. Indeed. We've seen, well, obviously Singapore, but South Korea, Japan, Malaysia have all pulled ahead of the U.S. in terms of doses administered per 100 people. Interestingly as well, the ADB, Asian Development Bank, has lowered its 2021 growth forecast to 7.1% across the region uh, to, from uh, 7.3%. And part of that is because of vaccination. So mm. we see that it has, a, you know, as we all know, a direct economic impact uh, as well. Uh, moving on, Steve, uh, we got just a couple minutes left. Let's go to our final uh, topic, which is a great grandfather in Spain was confirmed by the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest living man at 112 years old. Saturnino Nino de la Fuente Garcia, born on February the 11th, 1909. You, you going to make it past him? What do you think? <laughs> no. Well, you know, this story reminded me of and I want to talk about Bill uh, for, a, for a minute as well. I have a, a, my friend Todd. He says you should spend more time with people under eight or over 80 because they mm-hmm. have a different way of looking at life than those mm. in between those. Nice. They, have, they have an innocence and they have an experience. Um, and so I, uh, I, I am not smart like my friend Todd, and I don't do that nearly enough. But Glenn, you do follow my friend Todd's <laughs> advice. And, and you're, a better, you're a better person you know, for well, it. I don't know um, about that. You, well, <laughs> that's no, not, that's and, not 
<laughs> Let's not it, take it too far. <laughs> no, no. And I'm referring, of course, to our mutual friend, your, your, you know, uh, uh, you know, Bill Hook, uh, you know, who passed away at, at the age of 96. And mm. and I have Bill's book over my shoulder. Um, and so for those, this was about his experiences uh, in in World War II. Oh, and Glenn has his copy too. Yeah, and I brought a copy today along. Yeah. You know, and and just spending time with Bill um, was just such a pleasure. <laughs> Uh, because he was he was a great man who was part of what you know we in the United States refer to as the greatest generation, and, and that's those who sacrificed everything, um, you know, to to stop. Typically the, referred the world to as World War II over, veterans. Yeah, yeah, who, you know, stop the world from 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 Imperial Japan and uh, and, and from Nazi Germany, and he was just such a, 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 a great person. He was old school, but he always had the best attitude and uh, made everybody around him just feel good, and so. We really miss him, and, and, and Glenn, thank you for doing everything you could to bring him into our lives, and you, you really you know, changed a lot of people um, through that. So I just wanted well, to, to thank you. Thanks, Steve. That's, that's very kind of you to say, but he, he loved going to your political evenings, uh, those of you that don't know Steve. During the, during the po- political season, Steve holds uh, various uh, events where he talks about the Democrats and Republicans, a uh, particular interest to uh, Americans, but other people go as well and, and breaks down what, what's happening in the political races, and it's all very inside politics. Uh, but Bill absolutely loved going to all of those and uh and really enjoyed the the insights that you gave to him and you could always hear him laughing when you when you'd crack your jokes uh in the room and, which was fun and i have pictures up i put up on my facebook page of bill just laughing as as i would be doing a joke because he always sat in the front row and i remember before he came to the first one glenn you you called me up and you said you know bill's really concerned because you're a democrat and bill being an older marine i mean bill's a conservative republican and he he doesn't think we should be doing politics um, and have one just one side of view when we do something in the Marion Club. I said, no, look, I play the straight. I give straight analysis. I invite Bill and, and see what he thinks. And I'd love to hear if he has any criticisms uh, afterwards. Uh, and it was just, you know, a guy who's a conservative Republican and somebody, you know, who's more on the Democratic side just could really get along and talk politics and talk about life. And boy, do I miss that we don't do that as much in the United States. Anymore. Indeed. Um, Steve, we got to leave it there. But thanks. Uh, thanks for your time today. Great to talk with you. And go to Steve's Facebook page as well to see memories of Bill Hook. Uh, thanks, Steve. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. International News Review. 